because I don't see the YouTube live recording yet. There it is. All righty. So I'm, I'm not going to reintroduce Kan Quinn, but uh, she'll continue the chemistry from yesterday. But more importantly, and this is the wrap up final lecture of this Boulder Summer School, followed, of course, by the wrap up afterwards. So I think it's great to be sent off um, on a message involving more than one atom. Um, you may have heard the joke from the past, you know, what's a molecule? It's a one too many atoms. Um, that is no longer the case. It's uh, an atom is not quite enough to be a molecule. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to return and to, to see everybody uh, um, here attending. Um, so in today's lecture, um, I want to continue to uh, use um, you know, to talk about ultra cold molecules, but this time in the context more about probing chemistry and particularly um, probing some micro Kelvin chemistry. So um, yesterday I started out by saying that many pioneers in atomic physics were closely with molecules, you know, atom molecules were, you know, they were, you know, there wasn't sort of a specific distinction between atom and molecule so much as it is today. Seems like, you know, often people work with atom, people work with molecule, but back in the days, you know, they were working with both and then not really distinguishing them um, in the way that I feel like we are distinguishing uh, them today. Um, the molecular being apparatus, um, were really key to this, uh, the many uh, important invention of the techniques. For example, you everybody knows that Norman Ramsey had a famous paper, the Ramsey, basically the Ramsey uh, uh, techniques uh, called uh, molecular beam resonance methods with separated oscill uh, oscillating fields in 1950s. So that's, you know, based on the um, the technology of, or, or, or the workhorse of that is, the technical workhorse is the molecular beam apparatus. And the field really sort of branch out into atomic physics and physical chemistry. Uh, um, and they share, you know, they, they, they use molecular beams, but on, on the atomic physics side, kind of investigating property of atoms or molecules. Um, and on the physical chemistry side, they really use that system to, uh, to probe uh, collisions, which are the, you know, which underlies uh, chemical reactions. So um, I want to start with a little bit of perspective kind of from the physical chemistry side and not, maybe not everyone knows um, this, uh, this, uh, this giant in the, in, in the figure here, who's uh, 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 Dudley Hirschbach, um, who is a physical chemist um, in at Harvard Chemistry. Um, and uh, did, did so he let me part time to Texas A and M or full time even? Wasn't What's that? You know, for a brief, I think for a brief period. But since I've been at Harvard, he's always been at Harvard. So, <laughs> so I think probably he had a return uh, to 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 Harvard, or he was just. I, I'm not sure exactly what his appointment was uh, at A and M uh, before. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so. So let me just give kind of the broader perspective by borrowing this 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 figure, which actually I took from the Nobel lecture by uh, Dudley. Um, so, from sort of the in terms of thinking about physical property, you know, from the point of view of chemistry, um, you know, to understanding the uh, the microscopic origin of chemical um, reactions, such as like activation barrier and, and sterile effect. Um, these, you know, long time ago in the long time ago um, in the early 1900s, these were observed using microscopic um, uh, measurements of reaction rates um, um, and techniques, you know, which categorized as the thermal chemistry. And of course, this predates the, uh, you know, predates quantum mechanics, um, and 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 once. Um, we begin to understand the wave nature of particles such as diffractions uh, and uh, experimental techniques continue to advance, then chemistry moves to the next, you know, physical, you know, in, in physical chemistry moves to the next phase to really begin to investigate the structure of molecules. And these include, of course, uh, the determination of uh, uh, 
of, of the double helix structure of DNA. But if one wants to look even deeper, you know, just more, more and more microscopic view of what's going on, you know, what, you know, why reaction rate is certain ways, uh, um, the field sort of moved into looking at dynamics. Okay. Um, so, and this is where really the introduction of molecular being comes in. And, and it's not just the molecular being, um, you know, Hirschbach and, and, and uh, pioneers, they were really into studying collisions. They were really studying collision that really, you know, will give rise to chemical reactions. So they put together two molecular beings or sometimes even three molecular beings to cross them such that they can have, what, such that they can have single uh, collisions. Okay, so, um, uh, Hirschbach had told me a story, you know, when he started out um, these line of research, um, people think it was very, you know, very, very, um, well, he would say like, this was called lunatic um, fair because it, because um, these molecular beings are so dilute. And if you cross them, it, it's almost like in vacuum, right? It's in vacuum, so dilute, you cross them, you know, Within the beam, there's no collision. When you cross in, there's even more dilute, and there's no collision. Like so, people didn't think it was possible to see collision with such dilute uh, beams. But nevertheless, um, uh, Hirschbach and Lee and, and others, um, you know, in the six in the 1960s, really opened up this field of chemical dynamic by um, working with these kind of apparatus and started to to understand. Um, really get down to elementary reaction where they can really, you know, see reactions. They can really boil down all the effect to sort of single collisions. Okay, so this include uh, things that I will be talking very in, in very similar spirit. You know, things involving with alkali. Um, you know, molecules made out of alkali atoms. Um, um, and and uh, in the early days, and as the as the detections become more and more advanced, you know, universal detection become available. They were subsequently uh, able to uh, generalize such study to more general species other than alkali atoms or alkali molecules made out of alkali. Okay, so. And that that give that that this apparatus or these you know sort of line of research now allow us to investigate really details you know want to have really details uh, pictures of chemical reaction without you know so much other influence you know not not a bulk effect but like really single collision. Okay, so um, now climbing up this hill um, is really. Uh, Perhaps you could say, you know, the ultimate uh, goal with this line of research is ultimately to be able to characterize the reaction process completely quantum mechanically, meaning that we could use, you know, we can solve Schrodinger equation for the underlying chemical reactions and predict exactly what will happen and measure it and then everything match. Okay. But, you know, th there's this this angel who is holding a harp, which is actually in the shape of psi. Uh, and that's probably a theorist uh, who, you know, can calculate all this. And of course that even that is very difficult because of um, the number of electrons involved in, in a typical molecule, the number of atoms involved and these problems are in general, not uh, um, certainly not analytically solvable and then numerically not exact. Okay. but. Um, but hidden in this, you know, we like to say, um, hidden in this picture is that the top of the mountain is also the coldest place. So maybe coal molecules have something to offer to, uh, to be able to kind of reach this, this stage of complete characterization. Okay, so, um, so let me uh, give you an outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So first I will recap, uh, about what I discussed yesterday, um, where we can now have total control of specific molecule, you know, these bialkali molecule from the association of atoms. And that 
actually opens up really new things that we were really surprised by uh, having such a system um, in the region of chemistry. You know, for, for example, seeing chemical reaction at this very cold temperature, seeing reaction playing out in so-called slow motion, you know, the, such that, um, let me see. So, so in these pictures, you can see, um, um, you know, reactions go from reactants to products through this long lived intermediate. And because this intermediate lives for so long, it can interact with a laser and be driven somewhere else. Um, and finally, um, we can control the reaction product in terms of its quantum states uh, by changing the initial quantum states um, of, of, of the reactants. And, and ultimately, we in this reaction, we completely characterize this process from mapping the quantum state of the reaction product in a correlated way. OK, so I'll tell you uh, more, more about that. OK, so let me start by saying the total control of a uh, molecule that was you know, achieved first achieved in, in, for polar molecule case in uh, at Gila, uh, uh, the Gila Caribbean experiment. And uh, this was using a technique that I had already introduced you. So um, um, just uh, I'm not going to go into any detail, but then to say that what was available then was a trap gas molecule in a single and lowest ground state. So all these quantum degrees of freedoms can be controlled and these molecules are prepared in their ground state at a gas temperature of hundreds of nanocalvin and density of 10 to 12 per cubic centimeter. But what was um, immediately, you know, surprising was that they didn't live as long as we had hoped when we, you know, set out on this experiment. We wanted them to live as long as, you know, say vacuum lifetime collision with background gas, uh, not, not faster than 10. And that would be on the order of minutes or so. But they instead live on the order of a second, which is still long, but you know, much shorter compared to what we anticipated. But moreover, they are going away with this curve, uh, which we can characterize with a two-body process. Okay, so it's not an exponential decay, but rather it's a decay that seems to involve collision of two molecules, um, and we can characterize that rate. Okay, so uh, so the story is going to be based on that, uh, but just to kind of fast forward to today, well, at least. Uh, I guess 2019, that a true quantum degenerate gas of uh, KRB molecule was finally made, even though 2008, it was very close, <laughs> but it still took 10 years. And here's a picture of the, well, the broadly speaking, Jilla KRB team, uh, 2003 all the way to 2019. And you notice, probably see some of the familiar faces. Um, there is <laughs> Cadence here, you might not recognize him. Uh, this is myself as a graduate student starting um, uh, this picture, I think was taken back in either 2003 or 2004. And, and of course, um, this uh, effort was led by our, uh, Debbie, uh, Debbie Jin and Jing Yi, um, and we missed Debbie um, greatly. Okay, so let me go back to, to talk about, um, yeah, what happens in this, um, in this loss. Okay, so so could there be chemical reaction and could there be chemical reaction in such a cold temperature? Well, so at least at the time, it seems to be, you know, before we understood what was going on, it seems to be very surprising because in our chemistry class, class we usually learn that uh, chemical reaction is suppressed and at, at ultra, well, at, at low temperature. And the picture uh, for, for, for such an explanation is usually the following. If we have energy uh, versus now on the, on the x-axis is something called the reaction coordinate. So it's some weird coordinate that follow the minimum energy path of um, say reactant going all the way uh, through some kind of barrier to product. Okay, so this is the reactant. Um, and that's the product. Okay. Okay. So um, now there is an activation barrier in this picture, and this is typical the case for chemical reactions. Okay. So if we have some temperature uh, 
of our gas. You know, and we have an ensemble of, of, of particles huh? at some temperature. Let me just uh, put this line here. You know, say at 300 uh, Kelvin, uh, that may be something like this distribution. Okay, just uh, draw in like the following. And the ones that could actually make it over the barrier are the ones that are already at a higher temperature. You know, sorry, uh, sorry, not high, already uh, had possessed these energy above these activation uh, barrier energy. Okay, so that's 300 uh, Kelvin. But if we have now, uh, um, let's say, you know, 100 Kelvin, then the distribution that will look something like this. Okay, so um, again, they will still be uh, tails of this Bozeman, uh, uh, Maxwell Bozeman distribution of, uh, of, 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 of gas that can, the reactants that can, um, you know, that has the energy higher than the activation barrier and therefore it could go through, uh, you know, go through, you know, go through this reaction pathway all the way um, to access this product. So, okay. So, so that intuition here is, um, is, is given basically now, you know, in chemistry is written what's called uh, the Arrhenius uh, equation. where the rate is proportional to um, basically an exponential factor depending on this activation barrier and, and, and the temperature. So basically it just tells you the portion, the rate, the reason that it goes as exponential um, factor like this is because the number of particles in such a distribution for a given temperature are, you know, it depends sensitively on the, on the temperature and those are the ones that can make it through, okay. So that's why we had this intuition, you know, at very cold temperatures, um, you know, there are always there's barrier to the chemical reaction and at cold temperature, then the, there, you know, very few particle that could actually clear this barrier to make it into product. So it seems like it's non-intuitive to have chemical reaction at ultra cold temperature. But it turns out in the case of um, KRB uh, molecules and, and what it can turn into, say potassium dimer and rubidium dimer, the reaction coordinate, the, the energy, potential energy surface looks like the following case, right? So you can see that from reactant to let's say product, it's a downhill course. Um, there is, you know, the barrier is submerged. Uh, so it's a downhill course and, and therefore there's really nothing that really stop um, this reactant from coming together and, and then ultimately forms products, okay. So we can describe such a process as, you know, you know starting in different region, different regions of this, uh, this potential energy curve. We have the uh, asymptotic regime where we prepare these molecules. You know, they're still far away, but you know, they're molecules that we just made. How fast that they can traverse this course, you know, traverse to different area, uh, how fast could they get into a close region such that chemical reaction could occur is uh, dictated by the long range forces. This could be van der Waal interaction, uh, could be dipole, resonant dipole dipole interaction, which could be tuned by an electric field. And, and it has to also balance with the centrifugal barrier, you know, depends on if it's S way collision, P way collision, and this and that. And sometimes these um, these actually has barrier, like for the centrifugal barriers, uh, but they are they could be very shallow. So um, so chemical reaction could still occur, and this is actually is the case for KRB molecule. Okay, so I'm not going. I think I'm not going to unless I, some people are interested. I'm not going to talk too much in detail about how one actually um, calculate. Uh, these rates, um, because I think Jingyi uh, may have already uh, discussed that um, in his lecture. The basic idea is that you had these, you know, van der Waal interactions, and once so, so therefore there's some kind of length scale um, where this, this where, where you can imagine that once the molecule get close to that this length scale, they 
you know, they're at the point of no return uh, and they, they just keep rolling down um, the, this hill down to the short range. Okay, so once they're in the short range, then, you know, of course the energy versus the bottom of this uh, potential is very high, but what we're doing, what the molecule is doing is just kind of traversing over here. Okay, so there's chance of basically picking up a lot of kinetic energy once it gets here. Um, and, uh, um, and, 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 then, and then it could keep going um, all, all the way, and make it up over to the uh, products. Okay, so, um, so this is what, this was the understanding, um, you know, because chemical reaction pathway is allowed, you know, there's this downhill course, uh, even though what was observed uh, was oh, often, well. yes. Oh, what's the temperature or energy difference between the reactants and products? Yeah, so in so so this depends on the um, this depends on the uh, the particular species. So as long as it's lower, then nothing stops it. Um, but in the in the case of KRB, uh, let's say KRB goes to K two and RB two. This is 10 Kelvin. So it's not very much. Um, it's not very much. And this is one of the things that's actually quite special about the KRB molecule is that they are quite thermal neutral, but still it's exothermic in, 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 in our picture. And the other possible products like uh, K1 and oh, RB2K? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, sorry. Evan quite figure out how to use this very well. Um, oh, sorry. So yeah, so those are one, those ones are so K2, and I'll show you um, a, a direct schematic, uh, energetic, energetics. Um, so these are some other possible um, outcome from the two body collision. Um, and these are a above here um, by sort of thousands of Kelvin. So um, they're way, uh, they're energetically forbidden. So just the fact that there is one channel that, that was available, uh, we already assume that that must be what happened. But, um, but that's actually not necessary um, to be the case. And, and that's what I'm going to say that we, we have to prove it, that's the case. But that was understanding, you know, process of elimination, what else can, can it be? And sometimes what else it could be has to do with um, reason that we didn't think of at the time. Um, and, and, and the reason I said that is because there are many reactions that were subsequently studied or many molecule that was subsequently uh, study that these case was more like this. So they're energetically forbidden to go to these reaction products, um, all, all three combination. Um, but, but we still observe in, in those cases, we still observe the same kind of two body loss. Okay, so, so this is where um, this detection, dete this direct detection uh, is needed. Okay, to really figure out what's going on, and to see if we can learn something about chemistry. You know, ultimately, we want the goal is to confirm that chemistry does occur here, uh, does give these products, and and then we want to have a complete characterization. You know, comparing what we can measure, you know, as detailed as possible to what we can uh, calculate uh, uh, theoretically. Okay, so. Uh, and that means we need some more general tools. So instead of taking picture of uh, molecules um, as shown here, you know, picture of molecule, and then just, you know, take it and hold it, hold on to it and see it decay as a function of time. This only tells us some, something about how fast they come together to get to the short range. And it doesn't tell us anything about what happened in the short range. So instead of just having that information, we want to get more information of the reaction product perhaps the, inter uh, the intermediate complex. And to gain that, we need something more general, which is to basically um, ionize these, whatever is in the, in, in the trap, in the cloud that we can you know, hit the, uh, with our laser and then push it to the detector such that um, you know, by the time it arrives, 
we can use time of flight information. You know, it's the same force if they're all single charge because we strip only one uh, electron. So single charge, uh, but they all arrive at the detector at a different time just due to the fact that their mass is different. Okay, so from there, from the time of fly information, we can, you know, this is basically the, the, the working principle of a mass spec. Okay. Uh, we also arrange for lots of electrodes in such a way uh, to, as, as ion lenses, such that we can also utilizing sort of spatial distribution on the detector to tell us about the kinetic energy. So these detectors are arranged in such a way that um, ultimately we'll see, um, you know, kinetic energy or velocity of a particular, you know, value will land in a ring um, or more like a Newton sphere and then crashing onto our detector. Okay, so these are, sort of common tools in physical chemistry. Um, so, so we need to, um, so, so we know how to, you know, we can learn how to build them, uh, but the important thing to really, uh, to sort of enabling a technique is, is to really sort of bring them together. So we use the AMO techniques to be able to create molecule, very cold temperature in a quantum state selected way. You know, we can change that quantum state for study. Um, and we use this more general physical chemistry tools to probe them. So ultimately the apparatus is pretty complicated. We have uh, chambers, you know, sections of chambers that makes these molecules, you know, starting from laser cooling, evaporator cooling, all the way down to a chamber where we can make the molecule. And then we have another chamber where, you know, through a long tube, about a meter long tube of time of fly, um, after molecules are ionized, they hit our detector and we can learn something about them. Okay, so, um, now, to probe the reactions, um, you, you can just think about the starting point of creating a molecule sort of as some micro Kelvin at a temperature, sorry, at, 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 a, at, at, at a number about 10,000. Yes. Um, you froze there for maybe 30 seconds or something. Oh. So maybe you want to repeat what you said. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Um, so the, the point here is, is just that we we had to build a very complicated apparatus and uh, and and and, uh, and and put the tools together to be able to um, you know take advantage of the the quantum state control that we can achieve with AMO physics techniques and to use the general chemistry tools to um, um, to to probe what actually happened. Okay, so. The start of the experiment to really probe it, you can just think of it as a guess that we already prepare with about number of 10,000 and the temperature of some micro Kelvin. And we can probe then, you know, instead of seeing it with absorption imaging, we can go in with a much faster repetition rate. Uh, but each, each, each pulse is very short uh, to ionize our, 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 our gas and, and, and then probe its mass or composition and, and, and kinetic energy information. Okay, so once everything is put together, um, this is again, this picture that I uh, show, but now with numbers you know, um, about the energetic of the reactions. Okay, so this is the mass spectrum. We, uh, we ionize at a particular wavelength and we were able to indeed see um, some you know, candidates for reaction products, so K2 plus and RB2 plus. Okay, so we had to do actually a lot of uh, sort of detected work to make sure that this is indeed uh, reaction products coming from such a reaction and it's not just somehow we have some residual K2 and RB2 in our system because we work with potassium, rubidium, and then these things just kind of naturally um, lies around. The way that we uh, detect it is to look at the kinetic distribution. So basically, uh, let me just draw here. Um, if I have a reaction um, with you know, two molecules at, basically zero temperature, right? Uh, I could say that their total, their momentum 
I'm just going to say the momentum of such a system um, is basically zero. Okay. But after a reaction occur, okay, uh, K2 RB2 is going to fly away. Actually, I should have draw them in more in a line. They, they really fly away in such a way that the momentum is not changed. Total momentum is not changed because momentum has to be conserved, right? So P, let's say P1 plus P2 has to again be zero. Okay, so then these momentum has to be correlated um, and that's something we could check because we will get the information about the kinetic energy. Okay, so in the picture here, you see a very small dot of KRB because it's very cold, it's almost not moving, um, velocity is zero. Um, and that's exactly what we prepare the ultra cold uh, molecules uh, to begin with. But after, and then we can blow up and then characterize some kind of um, radius and that's kind of the resolution limit. Um, after, um, and, and we can also look at the K2 and RB2, uh, gas and their, their distribution and characters characterized by some radius and, and get a, give us information about uh, kinetic energy and, and find some ratio. And we found that uh, it's indeed the case where, you know, if, if let's say uh, momentum is conserved, then we know uh, basically, uh, I'm not going to uh, keep vectors. I'm just gonna say like, M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2 when they carry out the momentum, so K2 and RB2 uh, in opposite directions. And therefore we will have you know, P1 over P2 with a ratio of basically plugging in um, what you would expect. Okay, so these kinetic energy are going to be inversely proportional to the mass. Um, and this number matches what we measure. So, um, so this is one clue and we did a bunch of other things about timing and things like that. Okay, Hong so Kong, now, yes. Is the momentum spread of the reaction products com um, similar to like a temperature? Does it have the same momentum distribution as like a 10 Kelvin gas? Or am I thinking about that wrong? Yeah, so that is an interesting question. Okay, so we'll get to that. And, and um, the that is actually, um, so we'll get to that at the end. So basically to, to end, may, maybe a short answer to the question is, it's not a 10 Kelvin gas. It depends on where the states are. And ultimately, if you say, um, um, Ultimately, this is a question that we want to answer by say Schrodinger equation, you know, like if we start with one quantum state, what is the branching ratio to all the different quantum states that are the possible outcomes? And that's, um, you know, we can have some educated guess, but um, it could also just be like, we have to do the calculation to know. I see, okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, so so that's what we, um, yeah, so, so then this confirms that indeed these are the reaction products, you know, coming from collision of two KRB molecules and, and therefore chemical reaction indeed happen at this temperature, okay. Of course, now you know that, you know, nothing really should stop it from happening because chemical reaction, you know, in, in this potential energy surface, it just runs downhill. So temperature being very cold doesn't, doesn't really stop it from happening, okay. But nevertheless, it was still very um, interesting and still puzzled us for a very long time. Okay, so then now, um, so this is the picture that I already show um, that we were able to see these reaction products. What else do we see? Um, well, there were a little bit of signal here and I've told you that these triatomic species are energetically forbidden, right? So they're, they're, they would be here. So energetically forbidden from the two body reactions. So I'm not gonna go into any de too much detail about um, sort of all the work that we've done uh, to identify what they are. Um, in the end, we were able to attribute this signal uh, that comes from the reaction intermediates and we dissociate this reaction intermediate K2RB2 in the process such that, um, 
you know, that in the process we get a triatomic ion. So it's not that these didn't come from neutral triatomic uh, molecules. Okay. So we see when we change wavelength and, and we did a bunch of other things, we are able to see these three signals that are dramatically rise above the, the noise floor and they all came from the same source, which is this um, reaction complex uh, intermediate. Okay. Okay, so this is actually really interesting and, and, and surprising. And, um, and the reason that it's really surprising is usually these intermediates are transient in nature. You know, when the two things collide, you usually don't get a glimpse of, you know, or have any time to see these intermediates before they just fly apart. So, so this was actually really uh, interesting and a big deal. Okay, so the long-lived intermediate complex, uh, so the, by long-lived, I mean long, you know, longer than, let's say, uh, picoseconds and longer than, you know, sort of vibration periods and rotation periods of molecules. So when they come together, you know, if they bounce off many times and then kind of couldn't figure out how to, you know, dissociate into molecule, um, then it will take longer time than, than, um, than these kind of characteristic vibration and rotation uh, time scale. If they, you know, normally reaction comes in like this and then they just, you know, bounce and then they go um, um, and then, you know, they succeed in reacting and then they go out into the reaction products. Okay, so, so I want to talk about this time scale. Okay, so this is long live and this is time, this is a time scale that one can make some estimate. Okay, so because we have a very deep well here, so as shown here, this is in wave number and then uh, an, an sort of an easy, uh, a unit conversion is that one wave number is about one Kelvin. Okay, not exactly, but it's about that. Okay, so so 200, you know, 200, you know 300 Kelvin below, let's say uh, down here, and then this is 10 Kelvin. Okay, so this is much closer and this is very, very deep. So classically speaking, you can imagine, you know, if something traverses such a potential energy surface, you'll probably get stuck here because this opening is so small and so, you know, in energy that it's very difficult to find its way out. Okay, so that's sort of the classical picture. Uh, quantum mechanically, everything just stay up here. Okay, but how long it can get stuck in this uh, can be estimated using uh, a theory um, a, a call, uh, that's made, that's called RKN is made from uh, four different uh, people's name. Okay. So what this is actually something um, in, quite intuitive. Okay. So this complex lifetime is, is as written here is H times the density of states. Okay. So the density of states of the complex which would be high for such a deep well, uh, divided by the number of open channels or uh, allow quantum channels um, in the outcome. So this, many of this, and then there's also one outcome, which is one outcome this way, which is the way that it came in. Okay, so this is nothing but, um, but you can think of it as a time energy uncertain relation. Um, which I'll just remind you, um, delta E, delta T, you know, less than half H bar. Uh, so if you rearrange delta T, you see that, you know, inverse of delta E is the density of states and uh, H bar is still there or H is still there. And then, and then, and then the number of um, open channel is uh, additional, uh, you know, counting uh, that that contribute. Okay, so now this formula is simple, but to calculate the density of state is actually uh, non-trivial and uh, um, not gonna get into that, but okay, so theory uh, calculation based on different calculation of density state, indeed say that such a, a complex could live for quite a long time, you know, three microseconds or, or uh, a tenth of that and much longer than picoseconds. 
the fact that we were able to see anything um, already observe these complex actually doesn't um, discriminate one theory from the other because we don't really know the ionization cross section. But it's already, you know, everything is already sort of put uh, fall together uh, nicely. Okay, so now, um, now we we really want to directly detect this lifetime, not just making such a measurement. And that's something we were able to do uh, in the in, in sort of subsequent work. And this is actually really interesting because uh, this couples to some some you know solving some other puzzle. Okay, so if I want to look at these complex, you know, which look for short. You know, technically, you know, from what the point of view of what we can measure is still a very short time, but in the in the in in the context of chemical reaction is a very long time. But technically, we still want to measure. It's not so easy uh, for the following reason. So the amount of complex, uh, let me just write it down, that we can produce, um, well, the change of the complex uh, population uh, depends on how fast complex is formed, right? How fast complex is formed is determined by how fast the collision occur. And that's really slow, right? Like we, we say the lifetime of these molecule initially is on the order of second. So that's really slow, okay? But anyway, they can form and we have some rate that's called that gamma. Now, um, how fast these complex dissociate, that's actually a very fast time scale, right? Um, it's fast from the technical standpoint. Um, so the complex, uh, you know, something, the the, comp, the change of the complex uh, population, this, this is a rate equation, is, is can be written as the following. Okay. Now, um, you can see that this is just from this equation, you can see that this is essentially a constant because uh, this is a constant. It does, it's just a rate of how fast the reactant comes in. This is a first order um, kinetic re reaction equations. Okay. So we expect uh, an exponential growth of the population of the complex at a rate of, you know, these lifetime, and then it dissociates and it reaches some steady states. Okay. But we we have to you know in order for us to see such an exponential growth before it reach to some complex you know some, some some equilibrium we need to determine that time zero really well you know certainly better than the dissociation time scale okay so um yeah so okay so okay the, it okay so there <laughs> So what happened was that we were able to clean out this population, clean out the population simply by uh, what we always do is to have the optical dipole trap on. So it turns out this optical dipole trap talk to these complex. Um, so in fact, all the all the experiment that occur in the optical dipole trap basically clean out this complex. So all the experiment that we, you know, the experiment that we did previously to show you that these reaction products form was in the absence of optical dipole trap. Basically we shut off the optical dipole trap so that these complex uh, can dissociate into the, the products and then we detect them, okay? But this also says that we can just turn on these traps, flash it to really clean out the population, you know, say down here, and watch this intermediate complex build up until it reach, uh, it reach an equilibrium value. And that time scale tell us the complex lifetime. And that time scale just directly by such a measurement is uh, give us 360 nanoseconds. And it compares quite uh, similarly to uh, one of the theory calculation, you know, calculating the density of state and the number of open channels to give um, of the order also of the same order. Okay, so this was really interesting. You know, we now can directly see this complex. We can measure its lifetime and we take advantage of the fact that, um, I guess this is the point of, you know, reaction really play out in, in slow motion that we can see it. And we use the effect 
which I'm not going to go into too much detail, that we can steer the reaction with light. Basically, we can put it into excited state uh, um, and so on and so forth. So maybe just one point here is at the beginning, I, I motivate that to see what actually happened to a gas. We want to have these direct detections. And, 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 and what this tells us that in all previous experiments, when we have optical dipole trap on, when we see the chemical reaction loss um, in the initial uh, two body loss experience, the end product is not a reaction product, but rather, um, rather most of them are going, uh, being depleted by this, this light um, once the reaction complex is formed. Okay, so um, let me uh, move on and tell you uh, sort of more toward the detailed description of chemical reaction in terms of its quantum states. Okay, so, so we think of chemical reaction in these kind of pictures as a scattering problem. Basically, we have some reactants, it goes through some intermediate complex, it goes into reaction products, and we want to make a measurement and also make calculations so that we can compare in a state result way so that we can say, you know, chemical reaction you know, react and prepare in single quantum state goes to, you know, all these different reaction products at these different probability. Okay, so that's something, it's what we will call a complete characterization of a chemical reaction. But it turns out already uh, only involving with four atoms in, in our system, but they are very heavy that uh, and in nature, and then the state of the R theory cannot actually do such a calculation. So we already sort of push the limits of, well, pushing beyond the limits of what's possible with uh, quantum, you know, quantum chemistry calculation. Okay, so, um, but we can still compare to something. And this is um, the question uh, that Michael had, uh, you know, what, what should that distribution be? You know, we couldn't calculate it, but we can make some educated guess, um, namely that because we see this long-lived complex, um, perhaps we can say it really scramble all the possible outcomes and therefore each quantum state, each allowed quantum state, each energetically and symmetry allowed quantum state are going to be populated with equal probability. So that's that's a statistical assumption and that's something we can compare to. Okay, so now um, that means we need to calculate what are the possible quantum state and I'll show you that it's not trivial, but still, you know, straightforward, okay. Uh, and in that we also have to make detections that not just detecting the reaction product species, but actually tell us something about what is the quantum state of that reaction product. So, so let's first talk about what are the possible quantum state outcome. So the fact that KRB uh, reaction, this reaction with only 10 Kelvin or 10 wave number uh, exothermicity is a real bonus because that means the number of possible outcomes are uh, tangible, are a handful, okay? So first, it's not enough to make any vibration excitation. So that would be more like hundreds of Kelvin, so hundreds of wave number, but it's enough to make rotation excitation, you know, say low ones, and of course can go all the way up to sort of, um, you know, depends on their rotation quantum number. So potassium dimer of 12, and rubidium uh, dimer of 19 paired up with different, uh, you know, complementary uh, reaction products. And the residual, you know, ultimately all these energy have to end up with 10 wave numbers. So the residual, uh, you know, these, these energies are quantized. So the residual um, energies are going out in the form of kinetic energy. So everything together makes up, uh, makes up, um, everything together makes up the 10 wave number. Okay, so in order to do that, we um, turn into a different uh, uh, a state sensitive ionization technique where we um, can you know, perform spectroscopy, for example, or look up spectroscopy data from prior work to first drive transition, which depends on the quantum state, rotation quantum state 
of these products, we'll call K2 and RB2. And then coming with a subsequent uh, photon, they are much higher in energy uh, to ionize um, such a product. So, so this way we're able to, you know, every time we have an ion, we know it has to come from a particular state because we target this laser first um, for a particular state and then the, sub the second laser bring into an ion state. Okay, so when we did that, uh, when we did that, this is what we saw. We saw, um, you know, we actually go into identifying all the, you know, perform spectroscopy to figure out where these levels are, wh where the state sensitive transitions are. And then we, you know, go there and sit for the, the same amount of time for different channels and get this distribution, okay, for K2 and RB2. And immediately you probably notice that for K2, we only see rotation quantum number that are even, even in their parity, even in, the, in these numbers. And Robidian dimer uh, rotation quantum number of only odd uh, numbers. So what does that actually tell us? Can we understand that? Okay, so we see a strong preference and I'm going to say this is because this implies a nucleus being conserved. So what does it have to do with nucleus being? Okay, so let me just um, remind you of, uh, sorry. Let me just remind you of uh, what you already know about Fermion you know, quantum statistics, okay? But in the case of electrons, you know, electron, everyone is very familiar with, you know, if we have two indistinguishable particles, two electrons of indistinguishable electrons, then we have to, you know, we know the total wave function of such electron pair has to be um, anti-symmetric in nature, you know, with respect to the exchange of the electron, okay? So there is the, um, the their spin can be singular or their spin can be triplet, but that just means that, you know, the spatial part of the wave function um, has to be, you know, if it's singular, it has to be symmetric, already anti-symmetric, so it has to be symmetric uh, spatial wave function. Okay, and then, uh, and if it's triplet, it has to be anti-symmetric uh, spatial wave function. Okay, so now our nuclei, you know, the the potassium dimers and the rubidium dimer, the nuclei are also indistinguishable particle. So the same rules apply, okay? So if we start out with reactant in a well-defined hyperfine state, let's say potassium spin point down, rubidium spin pointing sideways, and the spin is on chain, the orientation is on change after a reaction. So they're like this. Then we have, um, symmetric spin wave function for both of them. But in the case of potassium dimer, even though I, I probably didn't tell you, the potassium itself is fermion, its nuclei is actually a boson, okay? And rubidium is boson, but the nuclei is actually fermion. And therefore, uh, they had to respect, you know, the bosonic quantum statistic and the fermionic quantum statistic with respect to the exchange of the nuclear spin, okay? So this means a symmetric wave function, a symmetric spin wave functions for potassium dimer will have to have a symmetric uh, spatial wave function with respect to the exchange of the nuclei and that spatial wave functions is the rotation wave function. Does that make sense? Okay. So therefore that's also even, okay. And for rubidium, which has a fermionic nuclei, uh, those has to be odd. Okay. So, so this is really interesting. It, it, the, the fact that we observe these strong parity preference, it tells us um, what well, implies that nucleus being is a spectator mode, you know, it's a conserve. It's, it's, it started well-defined and then afterwards it didn't change and therefore it's still in the, in the, in the symmetric nucleus being state and therefore the rotation has to, um, you know, be restricted. So, so that, is the, so everything uh, can be allowed. Uh, so, so, so to be the allowed um, rotation state. 
Okay, so um, now we want we can do one thing further. One, we can one yes. Good question. Does this yeah. tell us that uh, should I think of this uh, odd like we have a little bit of odd, for example, in the K two? Is that a statement that does it bound how much symmetry breaking that could be? That could be um, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, but it's I guess it could just be technical. Um, it could be some te technical limitation that there's some background. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, I mean, if we want to say that, we need to be much more careful. Yeah. We. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what we can do um, to be even stronger is that because this correlation of the initial spin to the final spin, uh, we can even control the outcome or control these parity by saying, okay, instead of starting with a state that are in one, you know, well-defined state, it can be in the superposition of different spin states to begin with. And when we pair it up, you had to perform the uh, angular momentum algebra that can, you know, pair it up. Still unchanged, it's just that they have different, they could be in the superposition states now that the outcome could be even and odd because um, the spin wave function can be symmetric and anti-symmetric depends on how, you know, depends on how things pairs up, you know, because of the superposition nature of these uh, possibility. Okay, and that can be quantified. Um, so here is the data where we can say, you know, we start out with our um, molecule in the superposition of nuclear spin states with some coefficient alpha, beta, gamma, we can calculate after, you know, this still apply uh, nuclear spin conservation, but with the proper angular momentum algebra, um, that the anti-symmetric spin state will have some population and this and the symmetric will be one minus that, okay? So these alpha, beta, gamma can be changed simply by changing the magnetic field. At, at these kind of way, uh, at these kind of value range. Okay. Previously, the data was taken at thirty gauss. Okay, so and you can see that there is it's not purely you know alpha alpha is not purely one. There is a little bit, and so that may attribute to this other signal. But we can tune this in the range between five gauss to thirty gauss, and we can see you know calculate the corresponding symmetric anti symmetric. Uh, expectation, and then we see that if we look at two adjacent uh, rotation states as a function of um, this magnetic field, and you can see that these population does indeed uh, trend the way we would expect. We do the same thing for Rubidian, and we see, um, you know, again, again, it match to what we expect um, from from the initial uh, superposition uh, composition of alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so this this is very nice, and it tells us, despite we have a very long-lived complex, it doesn't actually scramble the nucleus beans, and because of that, we can use it to control the parity outcome. I mean, we can control, um, you know, probability. Basically, it. What we think is really a superposition, of course, when we detect it's a probability in you know, even states or in all states. Um, so this is the picture that show that by changing the magnetic field, we can change that outcome. Uh, one thing that we would be interested to do in the future, although it's, you know, first we have to do some theoretical investigation, is that perhaps the chemical reaction itself can be used as an entanglement. Uh, you know, can be a, as a mechanism to generate entanglement pair, provided that we start out with the right superposition of state of K and RB, and after a collision, nucleus spin uh, is a spectator mode, and then we know if we detect potassium dimer in, say, odd, we will get rubidium dimer in even, um, this kind of thing. Is there a question? Um, Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I was just wondering why you can only go up to n equal twelve for potassium and n equals nineteen for um, rubidium. 
and I I was trying to see if it, it if it was because the of the if it limited by the exothermaticity of the reaction. Right, so, it is indeed. Uh, hmm. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Actually, sorry, I do I do have a question. Um, is the is there a good reason to understand why the nuclear spin seems to be a spectator and why you couldn't flip the the symmetry of the nuclei in, in favor of the you know changing the spatial wave function to make sure that they're still obeying the, the proper statistics? Like the identical particle statistics. Right, right. So so if you so this is kind of speaking about uh, you know why we often like to use nucleus being for very long coherence, um, uh -huh. long coherence um, um, application is because they just they by sort of you need to have some coupling basically. Mm -hmm. So so we know just from experience that nucleus spin usually doesn't couple um, to other things very well. And if in, in the case when it does, and in the case what we're doing experimentally is we're just checking that whether it is or it's not. And when we check it, it's it's still a spectator mode. Um, so in order for this not to be a state uh, spectator mode, they will have to be some couplings. Um, and and yeah, that may be the complex have to live longer, or maybe they just have to, you know, you have to have ways of actually flip that spin uh, during a collision, um, coupling to rotation, you know, that sort of thing. So this depends on the magnitude of those uh, couplings. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, um, now, so that's interesting. But that's only half of the half of the information, or not even half of the information, because we know potassium dimer has such a distribution um, that's shown here. Rubidium dimer of such a distribution. What we want is in a correlated way to say when we have a potassium dimer in this particular state. Rubidian is here or here or here or in a superposition of some state, you know, some distribution. Okay. And that will give us the full characterization. So what we what I what I mean is that we really need not these independent information, but rather um, rather an information um, in in ways that when we, you know, to to really draw a map. Okay. So that means we need to not just accumulating our signal uh, um, to see how much land in this particular quantum state, how much you know, land in a different quantum state, but rather we need to detect reaction product coming from the same event. Okay, simultaneously, um, when we detect potassium here, we need to see you know, whether rubidium is also in this state. Okay, so that's our next sort of technical advance. We need this coincident detection. And again, we are using momentum conservation as our constraint, and this time in XYZ. Okay, so XY are showing up as spatial distribution on our detector, and Z is the time axis, the time of fly, and also has a distribution that we can correlate. But moreover, we not just you know seeing them as a particular species, we need to get the quantum state information. So that means we simultaneously zap, you know, rubidium dimer at a particular, you know, looking for a particular quantum state and a potassium dimer at a particular quantum state and see if the, they show up on the detector in the single um, collection cycle, you know, in the single ionization cycle. Okay. So so we apply such a um, experimental sequence. And in the data, we can look for these correlation and screen out uh, shots that are non-correlated, both um, in the time axis and also in the spatial axis. And you can see that these are all the ones, I, don't, I didn't write down exactly which um, quantum state these were. Um, yeah, we have all the ones that say potassium dimer in, let's say, uh, six and rubidium in five, but not, not all of them are coincident uh, 
they're not, not all of them are simultaneous events. Um, if, if they don't, you know, if their momentum sum doesn't go close to, you know, zero, you know, so after we screen out, these are the, the events that we know are uh, coincident counts, that are actual coincident counts. Okay, so now, um, now with this, um, we're able to, we are experimentally, we had the capability to look at all the possible channels, accumulate for some time, and then ultimately compare, you know, probability. But before we do that, we also want to um, to know what we would expect, you know, given the assumption, given the statistical assumption. So we need to be able to count these states. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is in the molecules that the molecule that we made are in a specific rotation, you know, n equal to zero states, and they're orbital angular momentum, they're colliding with uh, one unit of angular momentum, which is P wave, because these molecules are actually fermionic in nature, okay? So there are three vectors um, involved, NKRB of the first molecule, NKRB of the second molecule, and their orbital angular momentum. After collision, if angular momentum is conserved, then K2, you know, the, the ultimate product K2 and RB2 and, and their relative angle of momentum, again, is three different vector that has to add up to be, again, one, okay, add, add in the, you know, quantum mechanical way, right, uh, a vectorial way. So, but what we've detected is only the, um, only the uh, quantum states of N2 and RB2, but not the orbital angular momentum. So that becomes the missing information and that actually doesn't change the energy very much. You know, depends on what the orbital angular momentum is. It doesn't change the total energy very much. Um, so there are what we call here the degeneracy factor. So if we um, have say rubidium in some really large number, so 11, potassium 10, so these are large, a similar number, we have a large degeneracy, 32 different ways of making up um, then these three vectors so that all the conservation um, is allowed. If we have some small number, you know, for example, um, rubidium uh, dimer of one and potassium dimer uh, rotation of zero, there's only two ways of making up, uh, there's only two ways of the orbital angular momentum uh, that can um, give rise to such a uh, combination. So these different degeneracy factors are representing the different states. And therefore we expect to see more population at where the degeneracy factor is large because there's more quantum states and, and less population end up in the smaller number. I'm not gonna go into the algebra, um, although if anyone interested, I can, I can, and, uh, I can go through it um, in, in the question session. Okay, so now um, with that, um, for comparison, we went ahead and de detect so there's actually 57 channels uh, that are allowed, energetically allow, and then you know symmetry allow and all that. Um, each one takes about a few days, <laughs> and uh, and we accumulate data kind of nonstop for about a few months. Okay, so it's kind of a heroic uh, a heroic um, um, effort by my students and postdocs, and this was actually interesting. We we we've gotten this. The, the, the nuclear spin conservation result um, prior, like right before we had to shut down the lab for uh, COVID shutdown. And then during the time we were, we were thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have this coincident detection, you know? And then, so after we were allowed to be back into the lab, we um, set up such a, such, you know, such capability and afterwards, and we were also not allowed to be in the lab very much, even though we, after we were returning to the lab. Um, so we were running most of this data remotely, basically. So making sure the experiment runs really well. And then, uh, and then, and it's actually nice because no one is also there to disturb the experiment. So this was a data taken uh, last June. 
for about three months uh, to, 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 to September or so. Okay, so this is the full outcome. You can see that indeed, uh, again, we're um, showing the rubidium quantum number, rotation quantum number, and the potassium here. And this is the corner where the degeneracy is high. And then this is, of course, the corner where degeneracy is low. Okay, so we can compare them more rigorously, you know, side by side, basically. So our, the light blue is our data and the, uh, the dark blue is using this statistical model, you know, basically one divided by the all the channels and then see what's the probability of blending into the different states. And you can see that at a glance, they compare actually pretty nicely, you know, these trends, um, all um, matches, but because we have such a detailed picture, we're able to do more rigorous comparison. And, uh, you know, of course, one of them is very obviously that deviating. Okay, so this is the channel that deviate. Uh, 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 this is the zoom in. So basically, you we still detect sun signal, you know, down here, but that's very small compared to what we would expect uh, from, from this picture, okay. So this actually, we have an explanation and uh, that has nothing to do with the incorrect way of counting the, the, the state. This has to do with when the reaction comes in and then, and then eventually exit into reaction product. This is the state that is closest in energy to this exosomicity in terms of, you know, all the energies are taken up by the rotation it leaves very little energy to kinetic energy. And that has a angle momentum barrier. So this orbital angle momentum is not zero. So when it acts in the long range, it has these angle momentum barrier, just like the angle momentum barrier at in, the, in, in the long range on the incoming side. And that suppressed the population. It basically couldn't get out. So it's like, it, the reaction happens and then it all, all, almost find, you know, finds partner and then go out. But in the long range, it doesn't have enough kinetic energy to penetrate this, uh, to penetrate this barrier. So, so the population is suppressed. Okay, so that one we have uh, a nice explanation. But everything else, we actually don't. Okay, so, so we perform some statistical analysis and basically the result is that after we remove seven channels, you know, for example, uh, this is another one that deviates. You know, this is one, and then, yeah, this is one that deviates and so on and so forth. We can pick out seven um, channels. After we remove them, then it matches what we, uh, uh, what the model will predict. The model being the, the statistical assumption that all the channels are equally likely uh, to be populated. Okay, so to learn more about why they're deviating, um, I think is very difficult without an exact calculation. So we really need uh, theory to catch up at this point. Okay, so let me just wrap up uh, in the last two days, I, uh, the two lectures. I've um, started out talking about quantum control of molecules and that's really essential for what we want to do you know with molecule in in the context of quantum sciences we uh, built fully control oops I wanted to have this instead we built fully quantum state control uh, individually also individually control uh, molecules atom by atoms and that we hope to be able to harness uh, to perform quantum simulation and computations today I I told you on an effort where we brought the chemistry and the physics tools together to completely characterize the chemical reactions um, in the case of K2 and R, uh, K, KRB uh, turning into K2 and RB2. And there's really a lot of surprises that we found. And of course we don't, we, most of them we have good explanation, but it's still very interesting when we see that none, none of them we really anticipated. Um, starting from the fact that we didn't, when we built the experiment, we didn't know whether we really will see the chemical reaction. So we saw the chemical reaction, but it turns out, you know, chemical reactions, you know, and then they study the chemical reaction, but it turns out these light excitation by the optical dipole trap was actually the main reason of the loss that everybody else sees. Um, 
and we're able to control the reaction outcome, you know, the, by changing the nuclear spins uh, of the, the reactants. And that we hope to also be leveraged to, to go into some new directions. Um, and finally, I show you the example where we really kind of de de develop all the techniques one step at a time to completely characterize reaction products, quantum states. And we find deviations, you know, we can be confident that there's deviation to this simple assumption, uh, statistical assumption, although statistical assumption still does a pretty good job, but we can pinpoint the deviation, but we don't know the reason because we don't have a theory that can explain that. Okay. Um, and I guess I'll also give, um, I wanted to also give um, thanks to my group member who, um, who really, uh, you know, made all the things that I discussed here happen um, in the in the last uh, number of years. Okay, yeah, um, I will um, end here and, and be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Conquin. So I have a question and this is one of these big picture questions. So I'm, I'm so not a chemist. And and my sort of question is, how does the type of knowledge you're generating, like for, the, for this last thing of the state distribution population, how does it integrate into the bigger story of, of chemistry, whether it be different kinds of diatoms or, I just don't have a sense of how chemistry integrates as a science. So I'm curious how this sort of can be developed to, to other knowledge. Yeah, this is a, a very good question. And I would say, um, the, the connection is, of course, through the theory, right? I mean, I'm not going to be able to do an experiment that are perhaps more chemically relevant um, and, and investigating in detail. But through the theory, you know, through checking the theory or through checking these theories are always somewhat of an approximation anyway, right? Because um, you just can't do it exactly. Um, uh, through these theory, um, we could potentially make some impact. But I think these connections are sort of several, it's like several chains down the road. So I think, uh, yeah, in terms of very big picture, it's very hard to actually directly make a make an impact to, um, to, to, you know, I mean, gen chemistry is very broad. So, I mean, it's, this is also, you know, very, very much. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess it's similar to ultracold atoms and optical lattices is that they're reasonably far removed from silicon, for example. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, it, it is relying on a chance of theories, you know, chain of theory to, to be able to connect them. Um, so, I mean, I guess, you know, it's not surprising that statistical theory. Are there is, further questions? Yeah, it's not surprising that statistical theory is not is is pretty good. You know, everyone uses that, um, but it's also not surprising that it deviates when we uh, when that's sort of the first order uh, theory that is available. I mean, I for one am surprised that it works so well. Um, even that within a factor of two, it, I don't know. Maybe if maybe. Uh, well, the know. factor of two know. is is the you mean the complex lifetime? Yeah, yeah sorry, that's yeah, but the, that that one, I guess I'm, I yeah, I think order of magnitude is good. I I, I wouldn't really trust it to a factor of two because even that state counting, it was like seven hundred numbers of seven hundred, but you know here we have fifty seven, so I'm yeah. not sure what that. I, I mean, I mean it, exactly, and all those things. It's baked so much of this transition state theory that I know you know much better than I do, but you know these things uh, make so many assumptions about being equilibrated well before you hit the dividing surface and then being sort of dynamical close to the dividing surface and they totally ignore all the kinetic effects. You know, it's really, it's astonishing to me that they ever work at all, but they do empirically. Right, I mean, that's work. kind of the, the beauty of chemistry is just like somehow <laughs> gloss, all, gloss over all the details, but it's a pretty good explanation, <laughs> yeah. There's a and question we'll, from yeah. uh, Garrett uh, asking, can you make higher or, uh, higher order molecules than diatoms using this atom by atom tweezer assembly? Yeah, um, 
I think so, but it's very difficult, I would say. <laughs> I didn't show you a picture of the experiment. <laughs> so uh, I, I think there are other ways. Um, and that other ways, for example, in John Doyle's lab and many others, they are pursuing direct laser cooling of molecules. And, and in that case, their strategy is to, to have a molecule and stick to some atom where that atom can cycle photons efficiently and not disturb the molecule. So then in some sense, you can stick any molecule or you know molecule that has that kind of property onto the atoms and the atom does the you know, laser cooling for you. Um, so that way is, I can imagine to scale up to a much larger system um, um, in, in those kind of system. And they have already demonstrated laser cooling of molecule, I think probably with six atoms. Uh, but of course, temperature is not as cold, but still in sort of mil below millikelvin, probably uh, that temperature. So that I think is easier to scale. Uh, from our approach here, I think scale to three is possible, but you know, it's get exponentially harder, <laughs> probably, yeah. That technique is also similar to what like the molecular ion groups are doing too, right? Connecting an atom to the ion or that. Yeah, yeah, or, um, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I did have a, a separate question, which was, um, do you have pro like what's the next set of reactions to start observing? Like, are, are you going to anticipate like rotationally exciting one of the molecules, or yeah, even yeah. having for having like like a <laughs> entanglement <laughs> after you let them interact for some time? Yeah, yeah. I think I think on the one hand we want to investigate, and this is not a direction people have thought of, you know. But but I think you know whether this molecule can be, you know, chemical reaction can be utilized for entanglement. I mean. I, I, people have thought about that, but not in this kind of context, not using these kind, type, type of techniques. So I think that would be really interesting. Um, just new ways of generating entanglement pair, perhaps. Um, on, on the chemical reaction side, we have actually, since this work, been studying a simpler system, which is atom molecule, atom plus molecule. And we found actually really surprising thing uh, in the complex life. I, don't, I didn't prepare a slide there. Um, for the complex lifetime that we could also directly measure for the atom molecule case. And one would find that actually in the first place surprising because atom molecule density of states much less compared to molecule molecule. So you will already imagine that factor of the RKM lifetime to be much smaller and, and a calculation would suggest on the order of nanoseconds. So nanoseconds seems to be very difficult to measure. But what we found is something like uh, 300 microseconds. So that's like oh, wow. five orders <laughs> yeah. of magnitude yeah. different from what we would expect. And we don't have an explanation and nobody has an explanation so far. So I think, yeah, so we're, we're doing, you know, in terms of what we can do about the specific reactions are limited, you know, very specialized, but, we already run into puzzle, like really big puzzles, and and that that needs um that needs a serious explanation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see. So that that potentially show, and and I guess you know, Caden has this comment, like you know, RK might not work very well, like just for that case, and but then we wanted to know like why and and what what theory can we use to actually explain such a large, you know, five orders of magnitude discrepancy. Uh, mm -hmm. So things like that just come up, and it, it, there is one example. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, and and yeah, so that's kind of um, along the the kind of thing that we are investigating. Cool. Thank you. Sure. So the, there's another question in the chat yeah. there. Yeah, question about distribution of rotation state from atom dieton reaction. We haven't, so um, we are, yeah, we are, um, um, yeah, in the particular case that we look at, this actually is a, is a energetically forbidden to go to product. So it just is stuck into the complex, supposed to only be one nanosecond, but then of course it's very, very long, like 300 microsecond. Uh, 
in the case where we do have energetically allow uh, atom diatom um, reaction um, leading to products, we haven't but we haven't looked at it, but we're setting up to do that. So there was a follow-up that says, the point is really to ask whether the nuclear spin is conserved in those reactions? Good question. Uh, I, I don't know, but I, Matt, do you, Matt, do you wanna give some more comments? Like, do you think they would not be conserved? <laughs> I, I think there's a good chance they won't be conserved because in, in the molecule-molecule reactions, it's all on a singlet surface. So there's no electron spin that gets involved. Uh, obviously the atom yeah. is in doublet and so it reacts on a doublet surface. And so there's all sorts of hyperfine coupling and there's electron density that sloshes around in the collision complex. Um, and I think it's quite likely that the nuclear spin will not be conserved. And what would um, that in, in the atom molecule collisions? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I mean, like, would that explain the complex, the long complex? Well, it, it, mean, it won't get you five orders of magnitude. Yeah. Or whatever it is you need. Um, right. It might it might get you one order of magnitude. One order of magnitude. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Um, is that order of magnitude basically by changing the number of channels? Is that how I should think about it? Or uh, changing the density of states. So if you multiply by the nuclear spin degeneracy, it's order of magnitude close enough. Right, um, but the number of product channel also change. They don't cancel. Uh, maybe. But okay, I'd one order of magnitude, that. I guess. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the five orders of magnitude might be if your total angular momentum could change, but God knows what coupling would do that. Right. <laughs> Because so the Christianen paper had estimates for the density of states if if the total angular momentum was was mixed. Yeah, I think they have. That um, might be big enough, but they, I can't I think, think of a coupling that would do that. Three orders of magnitude. I don't know. Two well, or three orders of magnitude. Maybe. But what coupling does that? Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving it to the theorist. You know, we did. Yes, and we don't know either. <laughs> well, I, you can suggest some more experiment, I guess we can do <laughs> mm. to, to clarify, yeah, to, to get more clues. Yes, well. Do you know of anyone who's doing these types of uh, experiments like yours with some of the endothermic or? the ones that were the reaction process was actually not supposed to happen, but, you know, everyone's seeing the two body loss anyway. Um, yeah. I mean, they've, 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 yeah, many people uh, study those cases and it's also found that this, the, this photo excitation of the complex is the, is the origin. Um, and that's primarily from like trap light or, yeah, or exactly. where people were seeing that. Okay. Yeah. Problem is that no one else has a, can observe the products in any yeah, anywhere this near this sophistication. It's all it's all yeah. depletion of, of reactants. Right, right. Only the sort of, a loss or a different rate of loss yeah. by changing. There's sort of half a dozen groups around the world that can see the loss of the reactants. Um, but it's only this one experiment that can actually probe what's going on in the <laughs> yeah. In the Are there further questions? So assuming there's no Zoom lag here um, and there aren't any questions, I'd like to again thank Conquen for her uh, two lectures and remind everyone that at two o'clock we'll have the final wrap-up session and I hope to see you all there. Thanks, Conquen. Thank you. See ya.